Heritage tourism is a fast-growing industry, and this is a trend that has not been missed by the city of Pensacola, who has tried several times to develop a heritage tourism program for their downtown area. Unfortunately, each one has failed to uh, go, go to the degree that they wanted to go to. So, um, <clears throat> and uh, perhaps most alarming to us, the last couple of attempts have been developed entirely by business owners who tended to see the archaeology as something that was just in the way of their new buildings and the interpretation as something that just be tacked on and not really worried about. I literally heard someone say, let's put in cannons, people like cannons. That was their idea of interpretation. So it occurred to us that next time this comes around, it'd be a good idea to have something ready to show them. Interpretation, not something that you can just tack on and expect to work, and uh, something that will provide them with a system for developing their own plan when they are ready to do so. So today I'm going to show you that an interpretive model is crucial for dealing with the complications in an urban setting, um, uh, developing a heritage tourism program in an urban setting. And there are a few uh, specific complications that we deal with in cities that we don't necessarily see el elsewhere. And uh, these are true in Pensacola, and they're true to a greater or lesser extent in any, uh, any city. Firstly, we need to make sure we have public support. Uh, this is something that the previous attempts have either lost or really never bothered to get. And seeing as this is an area that's very actively used, we need to make sure that we have the local residents and business owners on board with us. Also, another difficulty is uh, the complicated layers of history in Pensacola. You can see here that uh, I have a picture of the uh, forts that were in the city during the colonial period. The green in the middle is the first Spanish fort. The British did the blue additions to it. Then the British also built the black lines. And then they also built the red ones. And these are all in the same area, and they're no longer visible. So how do we deal with these overlapping uh, interpretive resources, and how do we deal with ones that we can't see anymore? And lastly, there's a large variety of potential subjects. You, obviously, we have some colonial here in Pensacola, but using these um, parks as a reference point. Here's the city in 1885. This is approaching its industrial peak. Very active port, railroads all over the place, mills all over the place. There's a lot to talk about throughout this city's history. And then here's the same area today. So how do we deal with all these different subjects, and uh, <clears throat> how do we make them work together without getting each other's way? So I'm going to base a lot of this model off of the tour model proposed by Sam Hamm. And Dr. Hamm defines a successful interpretation as one which provokes thought in the audience along the desired lines. For interpretation to be successful, it must be thematic, well-organized, relevant to the audience, and enjoyable. Now, Dr. Ham's model applies to all types of interpretation, but it doesn't fit all of them perfectly. And that is certainly the case uh, in Pensacola in an urban, urban interpretation as well. Um, so I'm going to have to make some adjustments. Before I do that, I'm going to talk to you about what a theme is in this context. Um, when we say theme, we, we often say Civil War theme or colonial theme. But in this context, that would be a topic. Uh, theme is the idea we want our audience to walk away thinking about. So if I was presenting this model to the planners for a heritage tourism program, my topic might be, without interpretation, there is no heritage tourism. A theme I might develop from that is heritage tourism program without interpretation is an apple pie without the crust. It's short, it's memorable, it doesn't make a demand on the audience, it doesn't, it isn't a question, it's just the idea I want to make sure they're walking away thinking about. Now, it's important that when we're doing our interpretations, we develop our themes first for a couple of reasons. One, it tells us what needs to go into our program, but perhaps more importantly, it tells us when we're done. So anything that doesn't support our theme probably doesn't belong in our interpretation. Now, in um, an area as large and complicated as this, I've had to split the tour model into a couple different phases. The planning phase is really all about theme development. There's a few additional steps in here. Um, and the global theme is the first one. The global theme is just a regular theme, but it's very broad. It restricts the topics we can include very little or none at all. And it helps to guide development of our themes and the interpretations from those themes. 
So a couple examples of global themes we might develop. How different cultures use the landscape. We can see how different cultures lived and saw the world in the ways they used the landscape. Or if we want to talk about the visible past in a modern city, like fingerprints in the clay, marks left by the past are in the city we see today. You'll note too that both of these themes could be a, a global themes could be a theme within the interpretation itself as well. Once a global theme is selected, the next step is to go and talk to the stakeholders. And by stakeholders, I mean anyone who has an interest in what we say and how we say it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so by that I mean business owners, local residents, ethnic or various ethnic groups. Also, it includes amateur and professional historians and archaeologists. Anyone who has an interest in how we do this. And they are really key to our success because this is an actively used area. We need to make sure we have people on board with us before we start changing it. Um, and when we're in our meetings, we're going to be talking about what are your concerns, what do you expect to get out of a program? And of course, what is most important to you to talk about? And we're going to receive these as topics because people think in topics. So we would have to next develop themes from these topics that we're going to choose. And for the sake of brevity, I'm going to just choose one topic here. I'm going to talk about the forts that you saw earlier. Um, if for a couple of themes we could develop from these forts, if we're talking about the civilians in the forts, these forts were the heart of the colony, residents relied upon them for protection, governance, and their bread and butter. Or if we wanted to talk about the soldiers' experience in the forts, a theme we might choose, life as a soldier in these forts varied from dangerous and miserable to simply uncomfortable. So once we have all our themes developed, we're ideally going to be doing these all at the same time so we can make sure they work together later on, uh, it's time to move into the design phase. And this is where we start looking at where things go into the, into the area and how they're going to work. And uh, I'm going to continue with, through the tour model as it was listed, but really the organization, relevance, enjoyableness of interpretation is something that we need to be addressing throughout our development process. Um, and so the organization is based heavily around the idea of effort versus reward. If we make it too difficult to follow and we don't offer enough reward for doing so, we're going to start losing our audience and we're going to have an unsuccessful interpretation. So we need to, if we have a well-organized inter interpretation, we're reducing the effort, we're asking, and increasing the chances that people will, to continue, will continue to participate in our program. On a related note, <coughs> um, there, an audience can only reliably process four big ideas at one time. This is down from what it used to be. They're saying now that it's four. I think it used to be nine. So um, it doesn't mean that some people can't go beyond, but if we go beyond five or beyond four, we're going to start losing some people. So we need to try and restrict our themes to four. Unfortunately, in a program this size, we can't do that. We're going to have more than four themes. Also, we can't really control how many themes people consume in one time. So we just need to make sure that we don't overcrowd our areas. For example, if I was going to talk about the soldiers and the civilians, one could go in these parks over here, and one could go with these buildings. If we were to put six themes within that smaller square, uh, chances are people get overwhelmed, frustrated, and stop participating. By having them spaced out, it gives people time to decide if they want to continue or if they've had enough of the day. And the next up is relevance. Now, this is the, these, the parks on the right there, flipped on its side. Um, relevance, we all pretty familiar with. It's straight out of Tilden. And essentially, we need to find ways of making our interpretation relevant to our audience. Uh, we can do that uh, in a lot of the signage and such. Imagine you are in this position. This activity was very similar to something you're familiar with. But even on these earlier stages, we can start looking at improving the relevance of our interpretations. For example, here in these parks, you see we've got some very nice stretches of the fort walls running through the parks. So one way of improving relevance is to include multiple senses. So we might be inclined to rebuild these walls. Unfortunately, there's a couple of complications for that. You can see all the white tent tops there. Those are 
uh, actually tents for a festival um, that is very actively used as a festival area for local residents. And it would be a shame if our interpretation made it less desirable for that purpose. Also, remember, we are not just developing the colonial period at this point. We're looking at all of our interpretive resources. So we need to address how this uh, would affect nearby interpretive resources. For example, the bottom center there is an 1836 church. How would a great big wall running in front of that church affect that church? So our full reconstruction is not ideal. Perhaps we can go with a uh, colored walkway. There's lots of different options. But even that will help improve our relevance because an audience can say, this is where the fort walls were in relation to where I am now. It makes it easier to imagine the fort walls as they were, reducing that effort. It improves the relevance, increasing that reward. And lastly, we need to make sure our interpretations are enjoyable. And I want to stress, I'm not saying that uh, this is the same thing as entertainment. After all, people go to places like the Holocaust Museum or the Battle of Gettysburg, and they aren't looking for a fun experience, but they've certainly come away enthusiastic, and we want to try and get a hold of that as well. If we make our interpretation thematic, well-organized, and relevant to our audience, we're a long ways to, towards having an enjoyable interpretation. Um, but we need to remember that this is the primary goal for our visitors. So wrapping it up, I've shown you that an interpretive model is crucial for overcoming the challenges of developing a heritage tourism program in an urban setting. Um, I base this heavily off of the tour model, but I've uh, designed, set up the planning phase for a theme development and getting involved with our stakeholders. And of course, the design phase is where we start working out where things go and how they'll fit together. And we need to remember, always remember that our interpretation should be well-organized, relevant, and enjoyable. Thank you.